Welcome to The Swing of Things with Amanda Krause. Our podcast covers all things rowing within the United States and is produced by Row 360. I'm your host, Amanda Kraus. This episode is hosted by U.S. Rowing Athlete Council Chair and London 2012 Olympian Sarah Hendershot. She speaks to some of the U.S. team racing at the World Rowing Under-23 Championships in Varese, Italy. Two-time world silver medalist Jacob Hudgens is set to compete in the men's eight. Former under-19 world champion Margaret Hedeman returns to sweep for her second under-23 world championships, this time in the women's eight. Sarah is also joined by women's eight coach Kevin Sauer and lightweight women's single and men's eight coach Jesse Foglia. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. My name is Sarah Hendershot. I am your host for today's podcast episode. I would love to just kick this off by having everybody introduce themselves. And if you could just say your name, where you're from, what college program you are rowing for or coaching, and then what boat you are in for this summer or boat you're coaching for the summer, that would be great so that everybody in the audience knows who we're talking to. So first up, Jacob, could you introduce yourself? Hey guys, I'm Jacob Hodgins. I'm from Ann Arbor, Massachusetts. Um, I go to Dartmouth College and I'm racing in the men's eight. Awesome. Margaret, could you go next? Hey, I'm Margaret Hedeman. I'm from Concord, Massachusetts, close by. Um, I go to Yale University and I'm in the women's eight. I will do my best not to hold that against you, Margaret. Yale was one of our biggest competitors. I also saw your mom rode for Yale, so I'll be as nice as I can. Um, Jesse, you're next. Uh, my name is Jesse Foley. I'm the lead coach for the men's sweep group training here in Boston. Uh, so that'd be the men's eight and the men's four. Um, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, but have spent the last seven years here in Boston coaching at Harvard University. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and last but not least, Kevin, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kevin Sauer. I'm the uh, women's coach at UVA. I'm originally from Indiana and went to Purdue and coached there. And I'm coached in the women's eight, not this week, but normally coach women's eight. Awesome. I love it. Um, and I've got a soft spot for Kevin because he recruited me and was almost my coach. Um, and so I'm excited to have all of you here with us today. What I'm really excited to hear about is how camp has been going, uh, how you know, you're know you excited for the world championship that's coming up. You're all traveling in about a week, right? So it's coming up really quickly. I think by the time this airs, you will be abroad, ready to light the course on fire. So what I'd love to just hear from each one of you right now is how has camp been going? And hearing that both from the coaching and the athlete perspective. So let's start on the women's side. Kevin, how how has camp been going for you and all the athletes? I'm not there this week because I had a previously uh, reserved uh, reservation at a river house. And my wife said, there is no way you're missing that. So I concurred. Um, but the first uh, two and a half weeks were great. Um, Margaret came in late from Henley, so I haven't got to know her that well, as well as I'd like yet. Um, but uh, it's been good. It's been uh, you know, trying to meld techniques together as best we can. And uh, there's a lot of power and a lot of uh, also a lot of uh, energy. So it's been, a, it's been a fun time. So great group of kids. So Margaret, for you, somebody who's coming in just having finished racing at Henley, it is a short and quick turnaround from joining U23s, making the boat, and then getting overseas to compete again. How is all of that whirlwind of summer rowing going for you? Yeah, it's been really fun. And I was super lucky to have Kevin, you know, let me even try to do that. So I, I flew out um, on the Sunday of Henley to Virginia came in um, and we basically had selection like the next day. Um, it's been really great. All the girls have been super, you know, like welcoming um, and warm. Uh, we only had a few days to kind of figure out selection from there um, because it was me and two other women who came from Henley. Um, but it's been a great experience and um, I'm just super grateful to be here. Awesome. And and then on the men's side, Jesse, how is the camp in Boston going? How are the guys looking? How have the last few weeks been? Uh, I, I mean, I think I would say we're cautiously optimistic. Um, I, I think the, the process has been very good. Um, the, the energy and the enthusiasm that they bought, brought to it from an athlete perspective, I think has been infectious. Um, you know, we kind of came into the whole process with this idea that, you know, obviously in a camp like this, there will be some people that don't make the team, but ensuring that those athletes that aren't selected 
um, are bringing out the best of those that do. And, you know, they're they're part of the process. They contribute to the boats that do go over to Worlds. And I think that that, you know, the, the toughest thing in, in my experience, you know, doing these camps is always you have everybody coming from this wide breadth of experience and coaching and sort of trajectory over the spring. And it's being able to simplify it down. And we've been talking a lot about, like, let's make it as vanilla as we can, right? The most basic elements of of good rowing, the most basic elements of team culture and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I would say everybody that's here at the moment has been really, really enjoyable to work with. Everyone that started this process has been enjoyable. You know, we kind of went through a similar process um, to, to Margaret and, and what's going on at the, the women's camp, you know, where Jacob and his brother came over from Henley as well as another athlete. So, you know, we were kind of piecing the, 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 the puzzle together as it went along. Um, but yeah, I've been going really well, really fun group of athletes to work with, really excited to, to get over to Italy. That's great. I definitely want to dive into some of that more. But before we move on, Jacob, I'd just love to hear from you from the athlete perspective. How has it been going so far with all the men coming from different programs and, and coming together in Boston? Yeah, it's been fun. Um, it's always fun having a bunch of different guys from different programs come to one place and train at the same time for the same goal. Um, I think like the, the spring season can get pretty competitive between programs and to have everyone come together uh, at the U.S. is pretty awesome. It's going well. Like Jesse said, we're cautiously optimistic and I think, you know, we're looking forward to racing. So. I, I love that. That's great. And I think, you know, one of the parts that I love the most as an outsider now watching for any of our selection camps, whether that be U19 or U23, is that it's an opportunity to get people together on the same body of water that aren't normally there together, right? So whether you are an athlete or a coach, there's got to be things that you're taking away from people that are coming from different programs with different experiences that you can then leave this experience with and bring back to wherever you're going next. So Jesse, you touched on that a little bit, talking about how to bring together a crew in a really short period of time from a technical and a culture perspective, but I'd love to hear too, you know, as a coach, what are you learning from that? What are, what are you taking away that you know you'll ultimately be able to bring back to the Harvard team in the fall from this blend and, and different approach of all of the athletes you have? Yeah, I mean, I think from like a, a very baseline perspective, the thing that, that I always appreciate about the summer is that it, in a condensed period of time, you really have to focus on what is the most important thing. I think sometimes when you have this full long season, it's a little bit easier. You kind of go down one rabbit hole and realize that maybe it's not, okay, we need to reset and come back. And um, I think, you know, every summer I sort of leave with this idea of that, like what we're trying to do is actually very simple. If you can simplify the verbiage that you're using and the wording that you're using, if you can simplify the training and that sort of thing. And then the second thing, you know, from an individual athlete perspective, you know, I have tremendous respect and compete against, you know, all of these athletes throughout the year or most of them. And, you know, think that the coaches that they work obviously have done a tremendous job. And, you know, we've lost to a number of them at different points. So there's clearly a lot to be learned there. Um, and the way I frame it is that like, this is their experience and I'm there to collaborate with them on it. So I'm always asking, you know, is there an exercise or a drill that, you know, you guys found over the course of the spring season that was particularly helpful? You know, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Tell me a little bit about that. Was there a workout or, or, or something that you incorporated into the training that you feel like really kind of helped on? And, you know, in this particular moment, maybe I don't have one specific example, but I would say that there's always, you know, you're learning from the athletes consistently. And at the end of the day, it's their result. So I want to be able to facilitate them and use their experience that has got them to this point, not try to reinvent it and start over. Totally. Kevin, so I'd love to hear you maybe add to that as well. You've obviously been through the U23 seen multiple times with the women. What do you take back each year? And maybe what are you taking specifically from this group uh, back to Virginia that, you know, is is a learning experience from women that you don't typically see year round? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I concur with a lot of what Jesse said, for sure. Um, one thing I do know is that I'd like to have a lot of these women on my team at Virginia, that's for sure. Well, you already are. You have four of them coming from U19. I just talked to one of them. Everybody's got to look out for Virginia. Four freshmen coming in from the U19 selection camp. So okay. I think you've got plenty. Okay, okay. But I'm talking about the kids that are here with the U23s right now. And say so like, yeah, I'd like yeah. to have her and her and her and yeah. her and her. But anyway, it's uh, it's cool to see uh, the energy they bring and the power that they bring. Um, and it helps me. Was, my wife asked me this the other day. She goes, why do you do this? Like, what's the matter with you? You know, 
And she's, that's a good point. Right. Um, but it is, it energizes me because the, the, as Jesse said, the year goes on and on and on and on. And this is a short window of time and you've got highly motivated athletes that are here to get the job done. There's no excuses. They're sponges. They're willing to listen. They feed off each other. They feed off the coaches. If, if at all, um, that kind of stuff. And it's really, really energizing for me as a coach. I know that after I coach, a U23 team in the summer, which I've done several times. It's like, I feel like I'm a better coach at the end because of the experience that these athletes have given me. So uh, that's a really special time. And, you know, I, a few years ago, 2015, I coached the guys um, and it was like, I hadn't coached guys in 20 years and it was a trip. It was so much fun. Um, you know, we're coaching the women, coaching the quad in 2007, coaching the eight, 2000, uh, 2008, and then the guys in 15 and then the women in 19 and this year, I mean, just all these different experiences um, that is really energizing for me. That's been doing this a long time. So it's, it's really cool, really cool to experience. I love that. And Margaret, as an athlete who's been through many different rounds of this now, so you've done this on the junior side and then you have made a U23 camp in the past. This is your second, I believe, um, what have you taken from each one of these experiences from the different teammates that are not part of your club or part of your college that then you can bring home with you when you continue to row with your year round teammates? Yeah. So I was in the U23 quad last year, which obviously sculling is, it was a very different experience to sweep rowing. Um, but I'll say that, you know, you have all of these different athletes coming from different programs and the strokes are different. The personalities are different, but ultimately like rowing is the same and you just have to get eight people in sync. And I've learned so much from each like individual, I would say, as opposed to, you know, the summer as a whole, like I've learned so much from my stroke seat this year. I've learned so much from my bow seat in how they row in how they approach um, rowing and athleticism in general. So I think it's more of like the everyday, um, things that I learn from each of my individual teammates and each summer is so completely different. I mean, the coaching is different. The location is different. Um, and it's just been a great experience overall. And the boat classes and the disciplines you've been in, right? So you've swept and you've sculled, um, on these levels before. Are, are there things that you take away from, from both sweeping and sculling in these camps that you think are, are lessons for you then throughout the rest of the year as well? Yeah. I mean, the U S hasn't been as strong in sculling as it has been in sweeping in at least past years. And so I think that going into the quad last year, there was a different sense of how well we wanted to do. Um, you know, the goal for the quad last year was like the extreme goal was to get into the a final or something like that. Whereas for the eight, it's to medal. And I think that, so the approach has always been different. Um, we this year don't know our speed yet, um, but I'm just really excited to throw down with these girls. Um, but I definitely would say that the quad and the eight, at least so far, have been very different experiences, but very both like very valuable. That's great. And Jacob, can you tell us a little bit about the teammates that you're rowing with right now? Anything you're learning from them? And then what are you most excited about for this world championship? You're going to be there in less than a week. What, what are you looking forward to from that experience? Yeah. Um, the same as Margaret. I mean, I've learned a lot from a lot of different guys. I've only been here for about two weeks because I also came from Hemley. So it's kind of a short time span. I think I've learned from the past two weeks a lot about being positive through the process. And even when things aren't going great and things aren't, you know, perfect, you got to just keep moving forward and, and keep being positive. And I've learned that from a number of guys in the boat, but I think what I'm most excited about, and this is kind of a personal thing, but my brother's also in the boat. So I'm pretty pumped to be competing at this level with my, with my brother. Um, there's something special about that, that I'm just, super excited to do. And I, I mean, I was in the eight last year as well when we got silver. And I think this year is kind of about for me, just going back and trying to, trying to do as best as I can and hopefully come up with, with a win. But I, as Jesse said, we're cautiously optimistic. I mean, that's the goal, but you know, there's going to be some tough competition. And I think 
we're looking forward to that as well. I love that. That's awesome. And there is nothing like getting to row with your siblings. So really cool. Soak up every single second of that experience. Um, Kevin, can you tell me something that you're looking forward to about uh, this world championship experience? Uh, yeah, well, I've been to Barise before. Um, we had a kid in 2014 that was rowing the single and I was able to go over and, and coach her. And uh, the, the interesting thing about Barise is that you can't really see what's going on unless there's a jumbotron and there's not a jumbotron for practice. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can get out there and maybe see some of these kids, like keep coaching them since our time frame is so short with them anyway, is to get eyes on them a little bit more. And so we're trying to be creative and, you know, trying to find a place where we can eat, get a launch out on another part of the lake and just sit there and watch them go back and forth or something. Um, so we're looking, trying to look for ways to do that. Um, but it is like once you launch, it's, it's you know, they're, they're on their own. So the coxswain is a big deal for blind boats. That's going to be really tough. But uh, for cox boats, it's the, their responsibility is really, really important. And um, so we're trying to, you know, coexist with the coxswain situation and also trying to get some eyes on them even during the practice day since we're there like five or six days before the competition starts. So but what I'm looking for out of this is as I told them, the first day I said, I wouldn't do this unless we're going for gold in the four and the eight, you know, so we're going to throw it down with everything we have. So keep at it, keep doing everything we can match up. As Margaret said, try to mold together as best we can and bring as much energy and as much fire to the effort as we possibly can. And obviously it's for them uh, as Jesse intonated earlier was their experience, you know, not mine. So I'm just trying to facilitate it as best I can and give them the best environment and the best experience they can they can have to to win that gold medal for sure. Nothing like really racing for gold. So I love that. And Jesse, how about you? Anybody looking forward to the food? I said this previously to the U19 athletes. It's like you're going to Italy. You got to have food on your list of excitement things, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've already spoken to uh, a, a few uh, colleagues and friends I know that have spent some time there. And I have like the list of the places that you must go, you know, Volpe, I think has spent a fair amount of time and he had like the gnocchi place and then the pizza place that are like walking distance from the venue that you like must attend. So that's like written down and, you know, part of the midday activities while we're over there. Um, I mean, I think the thing that I look forward to the most is the racing. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, that kind of goes without saying, but when I, I sort of think of the racing, I look at it as like, the many layers of the onion, like we get to combine in an entire season over the course of the regatta. Um, you know, for a lot of us, it's dual racing or, you know, one meet or like a championship that happens in one day. And maybe you get that experience sort of at the NCAA or the IRA at the end where there's sort of this multiple rounds. But the thing that's, you know, I look forward to the most is we get a chance, you know, we we spend time here in the U.S. forming the team, developing and so on. But like there's nothing like the experience of going 2000 meters with that group of people like you can you can never mimic it. You can do as many you know two Ks as you want. You can do as much training. But like when you sit on the line and you hear, you know, the various nations being called off and you see the light change you know, that crew is definitively different from the moment that they take their first stroke to when they cross the line. And the great thing I, that I love about this event particularly is that it happens over a period of time, you know, four or five days where there's real growth and development that happens. Um, and you get to see, you know, the personalities come together and they become a team and, you know, maybe they have a great first piece. How do they handle, you know, being put under pressure, so to speak. Maybe they have a poor piece. How do they like handle the, the opportunity to then grow and develop that? And like as the coach, you kind of help to facilitate it. But, you know, I love to sit back and watch, you know, the nine people or the five people in the four, like really grow in their relationship with each other over the course of the regatta and see them, you know, ultimately at the end of it, hopefully have a result that they're really proud of. I mean, you know, I've, I've been to, uh, I think nine like world championship U19 or, or U23 events down and have six silver medals as a result. So maybe hoping that this year we can change uh, the trajectory of that a little bit. But at the end change of the day, the color. Like, yeah, but at the end of the day, like the thing I'm the most proud of is I think pretty much every one of those crews to a to a person like they really felt like at the end of the regatta, they had their best piece. So I, I really love that process of seeing them sort of grow. Sorry, long answer there, but. No, that was a great answer. And really what you started to talk about, Jesse, that I'm gonna pivot us into the next uh, question was about 
what the schedules are like at these events. It's a lot of racing in a short period of time. It's you have you have to be very dialed in. And so it's a great learning experience for these young athletes that maybe want to take the sport further to practice how to come in super focused, both both physically and mentally in this condensed racing schedule and to show up and perform every single time. So Margaret, the question that I have for you to play off of that is about your pre-race routine, right? This will be your third time in the red, white, and blue. How have you developed and adapted your pre-race plan for a schedule like this when you know you're going to have to race multiple times and you've got to show up and bring your best every single time? Like what, what works best for you? Yeah, well, I actually think that NCAAs does a really good job of preparing athletes for this. You know, we race, I think, three times over a course of three days. Um, so it's pretty similar. Personally, um, <clears throat> I like to get off my feet as soon as I can after a race, you know, re- recover hard. Um, chocolate milk's the best. Um, and then also pre-race, you know, I warm up starting a few hours before the race. I think that's really important. Um, just also getting my head mentally prepared. Um, and then immediately following the race, as I said, recovery, 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 just focusing on the little things you can do, you know, taking ice baths, putting your feet up, um, getting the, the proper fueling, you know, every nutritionist will tell you exactly what to do. Um, and then over the course of, you know, the practice week, it's really important to, um, keep in mind of the sun, you know, wearing sun shirts, wearing sunscreen. Um, and because there are definitely days that we're going to have in Italy before racing starts where, you know, that's kind of almost where the racing starts right before, um, your first race. So I think those days are particularly important for me personally. Yeah, that's great. You touched on a lot of awesome things there. And Jacob, I'd love to hear from you as well. What's your pre-race routine look like? And how are you managing the multiple time zone changes you've had to have in the past few weeks, right? Like that's a lot for your body to go through. So you've really got to be thinking about what is leading up into all of those pre-race moments. I used to be a swimmer. So in swimming, you, you warm up right before your race, like you get out of the water five minutes before your race and you're doing really hard exercise right before. And I think I kind of channeled that originally into rowing. Whereas like I would, I would erg like pretty hard before my race, like make sure I was doing like, you know, not, not hard sprint work, but I was, you know, I was, I was definitely getting the muscles moving. And I think I've kind of developed more and more towards um, just kind of relaxing before my race, make sure I'm like moving and working like mobility and then like listen to music, like pump up music, but I'm not trying to like go super hard before the, the real warm up on the water. And obviously it depends on how much space you have to warm up, um, on the water, but yeah. I love that you found kind of a system that works for you and to kick it back to the coaches. I think, you know, for any coaches that are listening, to this podcast, it, it, it's a, a trial and error process to try to figure out what works best from a coach's voice pre-race, like what kind of uh, meetings or phrases or messages that you're going to be giving your athletes land and get and help the, the crew have the result that you're all hoping for and others maybe that you learned did not work so well. So Kevin, maybe can you share to us uh, something that you've kind of built into your coaching playbook in terms of that last pre-race talk before you let your crew go launch? Well, I'm a John Wooden disciple. If you guys know who John Wooden was as a basketball coach at UCLA, because I'm a basketball junkie, I'm a farm boy from Indiana, right? So I'm a basketball junkie. So John Wooden is uh, the man as far as I'm concerned. And he, they used to say to him, he didn't coach a lot during the games. He would just like, just sit there, you know, and they, they, everybody else is pacing the sidelines and yelling at people like, you know, that get their ball stolen because the guard's looking over at the coach and stuff like that. And he said, coach, why do you, he says, I coach during practice. During the game, I let the boys play. And so that's kind of my philosophy is that you do everything you need to do in practice. And then pre-race talk or whatever it is like, go do what you're capable of. You're ready. You're prepared. So go play. You've earned the right to go play. So go play. And so I'm not a big fire up guy or anything like that. It's, you know, I do my fire up stuff on the water and practice, like get this done, do this better. Yeah, that's it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go. You're in practice. And then for the race, it's like, 
you're ready. Go do it. Go, go, go play your game, you know? So that's kind of my philosophy. I mean, the confidence that that instills in your athletes too, because you're essentially telling them, I trust you in this moment to go out and do the thing that we've practiced. That's great to hear. That's a, that's an awesome strategy. Jesse, how about you? Something that's maybe worked for you that's become part of your pre-race plan? Oh yeah. I mean, I definitely agree with Kevin. I, I think if you were to talk to me, um, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, like I would, you know, the night before the racing, like in a notebook, sort of write out like all these really motivational things that I was going to talk about. And maybe the pre, pre-launch conversation would take like, you know, 12 or 14 minutes and like, you know, I'm patting people on the back and, you know, really geeing them up and getting ready to go. And I think I've learned that like that sort of has the inverse effect where like they're, you know, I think especially these type of athletes, like it's not like you have to get them to want to go out there and compete. They are very like capable of that. You know, my, my thing is big when we, you know, meet as a crew is like we focus on what I call the tangibles. Like what are the things that we have control on in this particular moment to go out and execute, you know, like something might be a little bit about like the conditions. So like, you know, how we're going to execute in that particular sense. Is there a particular element of the race that we've sort of rehearsed and talked about wanting to excel in or tweak from earlier? Again, that's something that we can control. So keeping it as sort of insular as possible, you know, you might have a little bit of information on how your competition might race and you can talk about how you want to counteract that. But I think keeping it as internal and focused on things that are actually executable in that moment is the thing that I really try to, to hit home. Awesome. I really like that one. Um, so you mentioned one of the, one of the intangibles, then maybe the things that you can't control are conditions, right? So when, when there are conditions and if there are conditions in Italy, uh, how do you prep your athletes for those moments? Right? I mean, obviously there's lots of practice opportunities to actually take on those conditions, but what do you, what do you do the day of when, when there's wind or there's chop, um, to help your crew, Get ready for that. Jesse, I'm going to throw it back at you again. Well, I mean, everybody tells me that Italy is supposed to be perfect and flat all the time. So uh, I'm going to, you know, knock on wood and hopefully uh, hope that's the case. I mean, Kevin's shaking his head. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I don't know, like the the, the vast majority of of athletes that are on the team, like they, they row and race here in the Northeast, like the Northeast spring racing season starting in like April. I mean, you have races that you'll win in uh, you know, six minutes and 40 seconds and you'll win in five minutes and 20 seconds, kind of depending upon the the day. So I don't think it's something that they're ever unprepared for. I mean, to me, I think always adjusting to an extreme is about being as relaxed and loose as possible. You know, if it's a crazy headwind, you talk a little bit about how the race is going to play out longer and how you need to really be thinking about making sure that you're be- being direct and spending time in the water where you have the opportunity to propel the boat forward. You know, if it's a crazy tailwind, obviously it's a shorter and a compressed opportunity. So maybe we need to think about getting ourselves out front, uh, you know, a little sooner or putting a little bit more in sooner because the opportunity to, you know, make up that that speed or, or generate the absolute speed you need sort of later on is not going to be as tangible because you kind of can't go any faster than you can go. Um, but, you know, I think having an understanding of that, you know, we train in different conditions in practice. We talk about a little bit of those things, you know, hey, we're doing a piece in the headwind. Let's think about this a little bit. We're doing this in the tailwind. Let's think about this a little bit. Sidewind, you know, whatever else. And, you know, not letting it detract from the things that, you know, that you're capable of doing really well. You know, I think like at the end of the day, racing is all about excelling in the areas that you're good at, not trying to compensate for the things that you're bad at. You don't want to try to row down to your weaknesses, you want to row up to your strengths. I think that's some really good advice for for anyone who's listening. Um, Kevin, I'm going to throw a different question at you now. Um, I always kind of think of you as the culture guy, just because you're so good at creating cultures around teams. And we just talked about what a quick turnaround it is really for getting all of your athletes together for this U23 camp, selecting them, and then traveling to go compete what are you doing in this really quick time frame uh, to to build culture amongst the women? Uh, and how did that play into selection? Like, is that something that you actually look uh, at when you're when you're selecting the women, deciding like how is this going to play in terms of chemistry and culture amongst the group? What is that? How is that involved in your process? Yeah, that's a great question. It's such a short period of time. It's kind of hard to really feel. Who the you know really get a, a read of who the people are and what they're about you know because it's such a short period of time you know usually cultures generated over a long period of time you can kind of see what people are doing and who how they act whereas in a short period of time like this people can 
kind of hide things, you know, I don't think anybody is, but you can. Um, and then we had, as Margaret said, we had, you know, four people that came in just last week, you know, so we had two and a half weeks of, of training where we had a different group of people. And then three of the four that came in made the team. So it's really hard to get a kind of a bead on what people are like and that type of stuff. But basically I just let out the camp saying like, just be good people, you know, in the end, good people can make boats go really fast and bad people can make those boats go fast too, but it's not as fun, you know? So uh, just be good people, do the right thing. Everybody talks about what is the right thing. Everybody knows what the right thing is. Everybody knows, right? So just do the right thing. No mean girl stuff. No, you know, that kind of stuff. That's just silly, right? So just be a good person and, and anything you can do to bring positive return to the group is, is going to be positive for everybody. So um, I think that's the key thing. And, and again, it's such a short period of time. It's hard to get a, a real sense of, of you know, and build a culture on a, a team that's small and also short period of time. But I think if everybody just locks into like doing the right thing and, and being good people, it'll go a long way. And if I just go on the conditions thing real quick, I think it's really important because like, if you train the right way every day, the conditions don't matter. So if you finish high and release low, like you're rowing over four inches of chop every day, then you don't change anything you're doing. If you do a one side square drill all the time, then you know that that's a crosswind coming from the square side. So you do that a lot in practice and it just, you create scenarios where they're prepared for anything. So they can just go play like I said before, but that's a great question about culture, but it, but in a short period of time, it's tough, tougher than over a college season or a college four years. But I think just being a good person is a, is a key. Yeah. And that's simple and it's clear. Um, so I love that message. And I also think your, your comment on the conditions is a really good one, right? Prepare for absolutely everything. And then you'll be prepared for the worst day out there. Uh, so back to our athletes, Jacob, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, you're in the boat with your brother. What else do you want out of your rowing career, right? You're, you're going to finish off this summer. What are you looking forward, forward to? Where do you want to take rowing as a sport uh, in the next few years and beyond? Yeah, so uh, I still got two more years at Dartmouth because um, I'm taking a fifth year because of COVID. So I'm mostly looking looking at those two years right now. And I think you know, it's great to, to have dreams and to have goals for the future. Um, but I, I don't know for me, like I, in rowing, I, I tend to think like one day at a time. And I think like right now, like I'm thinking about U23 worlds and like, you know, uh, uh, in the fall, I'll be thinking about head of the Charles. And then in the spring, I'll be thinking about IRAs. And I think like, that's always been super powerful for me. Like just one step at a time, like you're not, you're not thinking too big. You're not thinking too far ahead. You're just what's right in front of you. So I think like as much as I might dream, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to race it at Worlds right now. I love that. I think that's a really great reminder, Jacob, to, to stay super present, to be in that moment that you're experiencing and, and maybe not to get too far ahead of yourself. I know different athletes actually connect to maybe different types of strategies like that. Some people are planners and like to feel like they've got a roadmap they're working towards. Margaret, what kind of athlete are you in that way? Do you like to just live in the the right now or are you looking ahead at where you want to take rowing? Yeah. So I just have one more year of college left. So I feel like I might be in a little bit different of a headspace. Um, I definitely think that taking it, you know, one event at a time, one day at a time is such like an important way of getting through rowing because it can be so tough at times. Um, I definitely want to row after college. I'm not sure what that looks like quite yet. Um, you know, I've done some development stuff with Orion and I'm actually taking the semester off from school this fall and I'm going to do some more sculling with uh, out of Riverside in Boston. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I don't, I'm not sure if I want to do like sweep or skull after college. All I know is that I definitely want to, you know, keep focused on national team rowing. Um, that's something that I think I'll never get another opportunity like that. Um, it's like such a unique thing to be able to do. Um, and so I have goals and dreams for, you know, after I stop rowing, but I am definitely okay with 
working through those things to prioritize rowing after school. If you could talk to other rowers that, you know, are either coming up from the U19 program or who have never made one of our selection camps or maybe even a walk-on, but people that are looking to take rowing to that next level, what's a piece of advice that you would want to give them at that phase of the journey? Yeah, I mean, I would say as a young athlete, I think it's important to look at a bunch of different types of rowing programs. Like when I was younger, I did CRI summer stuff, but I also did junior national team stuff. And I think that, you know, getting out of your small bubble, especially if you come from like a smaller program um, is important. Um, I also think, like Jacob said, just taking it one competition basically at a time. And that's where you'll get where you need to go. Um, you know, whether that's club nats or whether that's youth nats, just take it one race, one day at a time. Um, and if you really love the sport, then, then you'll know exactly what to do next. And I'm sure there are like so many resource resources out there, um, coaches who want to help you along the way. Um, so just taking it one day at a time. And my biggest advice is just kind of to look at, look at other, uh, programs and coaches and see, see what you really want to do. Awesome answer. Kevin, same question. What advice would you give to athletes looking to take their rowing to the next level? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think, I think it's, it's a well-used term and maybe tr too used, uh, too trite is have fun with it. I tell the kids all the time that I coach, I say, look, I, I've been doing this a long time, you know, and I, I, if we're not having fun, then something's wrong. So I want, I want you guys to have fun doing this. And so whatever the, whatever the stage is that you want to do, be doing something you enjoy. And I think what Margaret said about, Hey, you know, I want to tr try different things. And that type of thing is really important, whether it's sculling or sweep or this type of program or that type of program, do something you enjoy and that will fuel your future really, really well. And sometimes working really, really hard is fun. You know, it's like, I, I joke around, like if I do a, do a great workout, I feel like I've earned my shower. Okay. If I don't, then it's like, ah, I don't know if I really earned a shower, you know, uh, but that seems silly, but it's just one of those things where you, you know, you do something really, really hard and it's very satisfying and that can be fun. And um, so a lot of my definition of fun is different from some of my athletes definition of fun. I know I realize that, but, but I think it's, it's one of those things where create an environment and be in an environment where you get a lot out of it. You contribute a lot and you also get challenged a lot. That, that is something you want to, I want the kids to come to practice every day charged up, you know? So I think that's really key. And um, so I think if, if look for those kind of opportunities when no matter whether you're in high school or junior rowing or college rowing or post-college, look for opportunities like that where you feel like you can feed into a really good culture, but also get something out of it and enjoy what you're doing. Awesome. I love that one. And Jacob, how about you? What advice would you give to rowers that maybe want to try to make the U23 level? Yeah, I think uh, it goes back to what I said before, but like taking it one day at a time, taking it one step at a time is really important. I also think when I first started rowing, something that was really important was having a reason for why I did it. A really strong reason that was like core to who I am and like, that really pushed me through some of the really hard times. Um, and I think like consistency is also just so important, like making sure you're in that headspace um, every day um, or six days a week is just is so I can't overstate that. Like just, you know, showing up every day and doing the same thing and working your absolute hardest every day. Some really great advice there. Jesse, you're up last. What what advice would you give to to rowers at the stage? Well, I mean, Kevin, uh, Kevin stole my answer. Uh, I was going to say that, that you want it to be fun. So I guess we're on the same page, which is good. Um, you, you know, just to sort of build off of that, I, I think like, you know, sort of build off what Jacob said as well, like take it one day at a time and also realize that nothing is the most important thing, right? Like I think sometimes we get overly fixated on one particular aspect of our rowing, you know, whether it's like the erg or the technical piece or, you know, flexibility or whatever else. And you know, it's important to be a well-rounded athlete. So you want to make sure you endeavor to, to sort of develop yourself in each of those areas. Um, 
but also don't get too caught up or too stressed out about any one particular thing, think feeling like you have to, especially early on in your path. And I think that's also important for the having fun. Like, I don't know, the, the advice I always give, you know, in the process of trying to get people to come to the U23s or to the U19s or whatever is, you know, if you're trying to convince them to come to the camp, then like I'm very encouraging of taking that time or that summer off. Like you want people that want to be there and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a 17 year old or an 18 year old or a 20 year old athlete that's like, okay, I just need to take a little break right now so that I can kind of like endeavor it with this a little bit more energy. You know, there will be com a come a time, you know, you've been through that process yourself, Sarah, where like you don't have the option to like back out, right? Like there's no opt out at a certain point. Um, but I think early on in the process, like taking the time to mentally recharge and like take, take some space for it. And I think to build off of that, don't be afraid to engage in things that you're uncomfortable with. You know, if you've only rode port you know, spend a summer rowing starboard, you know, or, or, you know, a couple of sessions. If you've never sculled before, like invest a summer in or invest a fall in, like I'm going to really learn how to row the single right now. You know, if you're, if you feel like you're really good on the water, but you've never doubled, doubled down on like training with a lot of intent on the erg, like, you know, make that sort of your focus, you know, go out there and be coached by different coaches, go to different programs, um, you know, be really uncomfortable experiencing because, you know, stimulus creates response. So if you're not stimulating the system, there's no way to get a response in order for your development to happen. So, you know, get uncomfortable. I know it's like an overused term, but I think like for young people, it's like, you know, if you, it can be fun being uncomfortable, then you, you probably are going to be able to progress quite well in the sport. Yeah, that's a great one. It's a good reminder, too, that it never gets easier. You just get better at doing the hard stuff um, and you get better at it by making yourself uncomfortable. But I really loved that reminder too, Jesse, that you had where it's like, you don't have to uh, get stuck in the mindset that if I don't try and make a selection camp every single summer, that means I'm done, right? There are a lot of different ways up the mountain. There are so many different paths to take your rowing career wherever, you know, might best suit you as an athlete. And so, you know, forge your own journey because there's not just one path. Awesome. Um, the last question I have to ask, and I think I'm just going to throw it at Jacob, um, is Amanda's favorite way to close out these podcast episodes, which is to hear what your favorite post rowing or post practice snack is. So if you're to get off the water, what's the first thing that you want to eat? And you can pick from anything. Uh, Cliff Builder Bar. I'm religious about Cliff Builder Bars. What flavor? So I've had mint, definitely mint. Yeah. The, the peanut butter ones are subpar. Subpar. Mint is number one. Okay. okay. Got it. Mint is like really good. If I have to, if I have to have a, a peanut butter one just for the calories, like I'll do it, but much preferred. To win. Nice. I love it. Great answer. Well, thank you all for being on the podcast episode. This was great to hear from you all, both from the coaching and from the athlete perspective. I can't wait to watch you travel over to Italy and to race super, super hard. So by the time this airs, you will be over there and I think we'll be in the finals at that point. So best of luck for me and everybody else in the U.S. rowing community. And just thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Good to see you. Thank you. That's it for this episode of The Swing of Things. I hope you enjoyed hearing from our U23 athletes and their coaches. A special word of thanks to Felipe, our official boat supplier to the U.S. Senior, Under-23, and Power Rowing National teams. Remember to like, share, and follow from wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others to find us. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss future episodes, and thanks for listening.